All right, everybody. Welcome back to uh, the third lecture of the virtual CS162. Um, tonight, we're going to uh, dive right into some material um, and try to give you a programmer's viewpoint of this. Um, so the first uh, several lectures, we're going to basically talk about uh, what you as a user level programmer might see from the operating system before we get really in depth in how the operating system gives that view. So that's basically our goals for today. We're going to talk about threads, what they are and what they aren't, um, and why they're useful. So we'll give you some examples. And uh, we'll also talk about how to write programs with threads and some alternatives to using threads. OK. So um, if you remember from last lecture, we talked about four fundamental concepts were, uh, where the focus was really on virtualizing the CPU. And one of them was the thread, which is essentially an execution context, uh, fully describes a uh, execution state with program counter registers, execution flag, stack, et cetera. We talked about an address space, which is the uh, set of memory addresses that are visible to uh, a thread or a program. We'll talk more about that. We also then talked about a process. I did see some questions on Piazza about is something a thread or a process? Uh, that's the wrong question. So uh, as I responded, a process uh, is basically a protected address space with one or more threads in it. So typically, you talk about a process with threads. And uh, the question of uh, is it just a thread or is a process involved usually involves protection. And then the final thing that we finished up with was this essential element of modern operating systems, which is hardware that can do dual mode operation uh, and protection, which is really boils down to there being two states, uh, kernel state and user state, where uh, only certain operations are available in kernel state. And as a result, the kernel is able to provide a protected environment. So uh, just again, recalling from last time, um, we talked about how to take a single processor uh, or a single core, which is going to be pretty much where we talk about for the next several lectures, and give the illusion of multiple virtual cores. So what you see here is the programmer's viewpoint is going to be that there's a set of CPUs that are all talking through a shared memory, even though there's only one actual CPU. OK, and we're going to. Um, Think of threads as a virtual core. And multiple threads uh, are achieved essentially by multiplexing the hardware in time. So we talked briefly about this idea of these three virtual CPUs uh, executing on the single CPU by uh, loading and uh, storing registers in memory as we go. So we sort of load uh, Magenta's registers, run for a little while, then uh, the cyan ones and the yellow ones, and et cetera. And the thread is executing on a processor when it's actually resident in the processor's registers. And it's uh, idle or asleep when it's not. And we'll talk a lot more about the states of a thread uh, once we get into the internals of the operating system. But each, each virtual core or thread has a program counter or stack pointer, some registers, both integer and floating point in most cases. Um, and the question of where it is, well, uh, it's on the real physical core, or it's saved in memory, a chunk of memory we call the thread control block. And the difference between these two things is whether it's actually running right now or in sort of a suspended state. The other thing we talked about uh, was this idea of an address space, which is the set of all addresses that are available to a given processor or thread at any given time. And we talked about how 32-bit addresses give you 4 billion uh, bytes operations, and 64 give you 18 quintillion addresses, 10 to the 18th. Um, some of you may know 10 to the 18th as an exabyte. Um, but that's the general idea of an address space. What's more interesting for our purposes here is going to be the virtual address space, which is the processor's view of memory where the address space that the processor sees is independent of the actual physical space. And in most cases, that's involved some explicit translation. Uh, so the processor brings out virtual addresses. They go through some translation to get to physical addresses. And um, for the purposes of this particular lecture, uh, here's a thought. 
that you can um, put in uh, kind of uh, use throughout the lecture, which is this idea of translation through a page table. And uh, again, we said 61C uh, did talk about that. We'll talk about it in a lot more depth. But here we have two virtual I, uh, programs or threads or whatever you want to talk about them. And they're operating in their address spaces with code and data and heap and stack and all of those things. And what happens is the addresses come out of the processor and they go through a translation map. And again, however that works, we don't really care for the moment. And uh, after they're translated, they get translated into physical addresses. So the code of this blue uh, thread or process basically gets translated into this particular chunk of physical memory, whereas the green code gets translated into this particular chunk. Okay, now the question that uh, is in the chat here is are virtual addresses handled by the OS or by the CPU hardware? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so in reality, these little translation maps are usually part of something called a memory management unit in hardware, but the operating system is uh, responsible for configuring these things by setting up something called a page table. And so uh, we will talk a lot about that, so don't worry if you don't uh, remember the details, and in fact, 61C hardly talked about that. But for now, imagine that there's actually a translation map that basically takes these addresses from processor one, turns them into the blue ones, and from processor two, or pro, um, virtual processor two, turns them into the green ones. And uh, notice that if we translate it right, then blue can't even touch anything that green is addressing because there's no way for blues address space to get transformed into something that uh, addresses the green physical uh, memory, okay? And notice also I have the operating system down here, which is completely separate as well. So this simple idea of translation gives us uh, quite a bit of protection, okay? All right, now, um, are there any questions on that? Are we good? And let's try to, um, keep the, uh, the chat for actual questions here so that we can uh, get questions from people. So let's keep this mental image here of uh, page translation uh, and uh, how it protects green from blue and, both, and the operating system from both of them. And let's move on. So if you remember, we talked then about uh, processes. And the question here about where we store the page table is that's actually gonna be stored in the operating system itself in a way that uh, is not addressable to the two, uh, to green or blue, okay? And um, the, the reason that uh, parts of uh, user space can't address all of physical memory is exactly what you see here. Not every address, uh, you take all the addresses that are possible and they just don't translate to things that are green or white from the blue side. And that basically prevents the uh, processor, the blue one from actually even addressing green or white, okay? And we'll talk more about this as we go. Okay, now, so if you remember when we talked about processes, again, a process is basically a protected environment with one or more threads. Here's one with a single thread. Your, um, uh, your uh, Pintos projects that you're gonna be dealing with essentially have a single thread per process, but uh, real operating systems, or I will say more sophisticated ones can have multiple threads. Okay, and so a process is really this execution environment with restricted rights, one or more threads executing in a protected address space, okay, which owns a chunk of memory, some file descriptors, and some network connections. Okay. So uh, a process is an instance of a running program. If you have the same program running twice, it'll, have, it'll be running in two different processes. And why do we have processes as an idea? Okay, is, uh, that means that uh, those two processes are protected from one, one another and uh, the OS is protected from them. So this idea of uh, processes is really one in which um, it's the essential protection uh, idea that we're gonna be talking about in the early part of this class. Okay, modern OS is pretty much anything that runs outside of the kernel runs in a process for now. Okay. So. The last thing we talked about, as I mentioned, was dual mode operation. And here, processes execute in user mode, and 
kernel executes in kernel mode, but as folks on the, on the chat have really uh, talked about a couple times here, is if you think about this translation for a moment, if blue is able to alter its own page tables, then all of bets are off for protection, right? If blue can alter translation so that some virtual address, which was previously not valid, can somehow map to green or, or um, white, then you know all the protection is broken there. So really, we need some way to make sure that the user code can't alter those page tables, among other things. And so that's where the dual mode operation comes into play. Okay, so uh, processes running in user mode um, are running with uh, a bit set in the processor that says user mode. And in kernel mode, that's when the bit says kernel mode, and it's only if you happen to be in kernel mode that you can modify things like page tables. Okay, and we'll get into much more detail in that as we go on. So this is still not quite enough, okay? You have to make sure that user mode apps can't just randomly go into kernel mode and execute anything they want because what's the point, right? And so we talked briefly about very carefully controlled transitions between user mode and kernel mode and that careful control transitions uh, basically allow us to make sure that the only way to go from user mode to kernel mode is when doing things that the uh, writer of the kernel supports, okay? And putting things in kernel mode is typically done only with extreme care because things that are running in kernel mode have uh, control over all of the hardware. And so typically only the operating system developer puts things in kernel mode, all right? We'll talk about some uh, slight versions of that that are a little different as we get uh, further in the course. But for now, pretty much only the developer, the operating system puts things in kernel mode. Okay, and here's an example of something we'll talk about today for transitioning from, here's the user process running in user mode, excuse me, with the mode bit one, making what we're gonna talk about as a system call, which goes into the, uh, the kernel, executes some special uh, function, and then returns to user mode. And that system call is very restricted. So yes, it turns on the mode bit to one, meaning uh, that we're, well, or zero in this case, to saying that we're in kernel mode, but it only allows you to do that if the code you're calling is uh, one of a very small number of entry points. And so an example of this might be open a file, or um, we're gonna talk today about uh, start a new thread or start a new process. So this could be a fork system call. And so that dual mode operation involves this extreme restriction. Okay, so what are threads? Okay, so a thread is a single unique execution context. Talked about that. Um, it provides an abstraction, which might be a single uh, execution se uh, sequence that represents a, separate, a separately schedulable task. Okay, that's also a valid definition. Threads are a mechanism for concurrency. So um, we're going to talk a lot about that, uh, understanding that um, because of threads, you can have multiple uh, simultaneous things that overlap each other, and that can be very helpful. And protection is completely orthogonal, okay? So again, that question of is this a thread or a process is the wrong question. The process is the protected environment, the threads run inside of it, and that process would include, for instance, an address space plus a translation map through a page table, okay? All right. Um, by the way, the mode bit, <laughs> there's a question about the mode bit. Here, uh, let's just say that a mode bit equal to one is user mode and zero is kernel mode, but this is completely dependent upon the, um, dependent upon, uh, the particular piece of hardware. And in fact, in uh, x86, there's even uh, more than just two options here. So for now, there's user mode, kernel mode, okay? That's what we need to remember. Okay, now, what are threads? Okay, so protection is this orthogonal concept, but let's dive into the motivation for why we even bother with threads, okay? So, um, and, and yes, uh, I will say one other thing since this topic is coming up in the chat. So one way in which things get added to the kernel is device drivers. And we mentioned last time that those are uh, weak points in reliability typically. And those device drivers are things that get added uh, only if you're a supervisor, okay? And uh, 
and you've made a decision that you're you're willing to add this to the to the kernel and risk uh, that device driver. So what I mean by uh, protection being orthogonal now again is that the protection is the environment, the thread is the execution context. Okay, so those are different things. So a process has one or more threads in it. Okay, now for now. Uh, Processes contain their own threads and don't access other people's threads except through communication mechanisms. Okay, so what's our motivation for threads? So operating systems, as you can imagine, need to handle multiple things at once. Okay, um, you know, processes, interrupts, background, system maintenance, all of those things, keystrokes, I'm moving the mouse around, um, I'm drawing things on the screen. So there's many things at once or multiple things at once. MTAO, by the way, I made that up, but we're gonna use it for the rest of the lecture. So operating systems need to handle MTAO, okay? And how do we do that? We do it with threads. So examples are network servers have to handle multiple things at once because there's many threads, there are many, excuse me, network connections that come in at once. Um, parallel programs, uh, well, by definition, if you have a bunch of CPUs and you wanna run something in parallel, you need to do multiple things at once and a thread, uh, some threads could be a way to do that. And when you talked about parallelism in some of the 61s, um, one of the ways to do that is with threads, okay? Now, programs with user interfaces invariably need MTAO. So that would be, again, like I said, mouse movement, keyboard. Um, if you have a voice uh, interface, so the, the, uh, the microphone here is something. Um, things get drawn on the screen. These are all different independent things that can happen. And so having threads available to allow them to happen in parallel is important. Okay, and that's gonna make it really easy to program. Um, network and disk bound programs have to handle MTAO because um, you have to hide network and disk latency. So the question on the chat, as I mentioned, multiple things at once is a term I just made up. It's up top here, multiple things at once. Okay, so um, you need to be able to, if you're waiting for something to come off the disk or from the network, you wanna have a thread that's just sitting there waiting, but not blocking everybody else up. So you have another thread doing something else, okay? So um, now let's keep, the, let's keep the chat down to just things that we're actively talking about. Well, uh, the concept of how processes communicate with each other is a much more interesting extended one. So don't worry, we will get to that, okay? Uh, not today, but we'll get to it. So threads uh, basically are a unit of concurrency provided by the operating system. And each thread can represent one thing or one task or one idea, one chunk of code, okay? And so um, that's, that's gonna be our model in this particular lecture. So let's talk about some terms that you've heard thrown around as you've uh, come up uh, you know, learning about computers. So some definitions, so multiprocessing, is sometimes used when there's multiple CPUs or cores acting together on the same task. Okay, multi-programming is something similar, which is multiple jobs or processes, not necessarily running simultaneously. So the idea of processing versus programming sometimes gets at that parallelism versus concurrency. Uh, Multi-threading is just multiple threads in a process, okay? And so what does it mean to run two threads concurrently? Now I know that in the 61s, they try to get this idea of concurrency versus parallelism, but let's take another stab at it. What it, things, what it means for things to run concurrently is the scheduler is basically free to run the threads in any order and any interleaving. And the thread may run to completion or time slice in big chunks or small chunks or whatever. And so concurrently means overlapping with no control over how that overlapping goes. So here's some examples. Here's multiprocessing where we have A, B, and C are threads. And because let's say there are three cores in this system, all three of them are actually running at the same time. So not only are A, B, and C concurrent, but they're also parallel, okay? Here's a different view where we have the same three threads, but we don't have more than one core or processor. We only have one processor. And in this instance, uh, we can't actually have things running simultaneously. So one thing that could happen is A could run a while and then B and then C, okay, where now we're actually running A to the end and B to the end and C to the end. 
or we could interleave them. A runs a while, B runs a while, C runs a while, then A, then B, then C, then B, et cetera. All right. And notice that um, these two options here could happen uh, interchangeably on the same system, depending what the scheduler does or whether you have multiple things running, uh, multiple processes could use up cores so that maybe if you have enough things running, you get this interleaving, or if you only have one thing running, you get multiprocessing. Okay, and so the very important thing to note here is the moment we move into this idea of concurrency, we have to design for correctness. We can no longer just throw up our hands and write a bunch of code and hope it works because any code we write has to work regardless of what the scheduler decides to do for this interleaving. Let me say that again. The moment we start with having more than one thread and a concurrent system, we now have to start thinking about correctness. And you could think about correctness and just write a bunch of stuff and keep changing it until it sort of looks like it works. And I guarantee that is a bad idea because it will stop working at three in the morning. Um, or you can design for correctness with the proper locking schemes or parallelism constructs or whatever. And we'll talk a lot about that as we go. And then you can be sure that no matter what the scheduler throws at you, this will do the right thing. Okay. Questions. So we're going to, we're going to try to teach you how to design for correctness. That's going to be our goal. Okay. And again, the difference between multi-threading and multi-programming is perhaps uh, somewhat historical, but multi-programming came up in the days of the original Unix systems where there was only one thread per process. So a process had a single concurrency and address space associated with it. Uh, multi-threading kind of comes up in the, in the era where you can have more than one thread per process. So it's really kind of multi-programming might be one thread per process, multi-threading might be more. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about advantages in a bit. Okay, so just hold, hold on to that question. So concurrency is not parallelism. So look here, this is parallelism, A, B, and C running together at the same time. This is not parallelism. All of these are concurrency. They're the possibility for overlap, okay? So concurrency is, is about MTAO, multiple things at once. Parallelism is about doing multiple things simultaneously, okay? Where simultaneously, again, if I were to take a slice uh, across here and look at a given cycle on that multi-core processor, for instance, I would see there is an instruction from A, an instruction from B, and an instruction from C all running at the same time. Whereas if I have only one core, I see that there's really only green, pink, or blue. Okay. So example, two threads on a single core system are executing concurrently, but not in parallel. Okay. Each thread handles or manages a separate thing or task. Okay. And, but those tasks are not necessarily executing simultaneously. Okay, now I'm not actually talking about Amdahl's law, which got brought up in the chat, uh, because Amdahl's law is about the ability when you have parallelism to actually get, use it successfully. So if you notice here, uh, green, pink, blue might not, uh, you know, the green might run a little bit and then you have to wait for uh, pink and blue to finish before you can do anything. This might, by Amdahl's law, be very poor because the serial section is large, okay? So um, we're going to be uh, talking about, um, we'll talk about parallelism a bit more as we go on. Okay, now here's a silly example for threads. Okay, remember my favorite number, pi. Okay, and so here's a thread where we say main and uh, we compute pi to the last digit and then we print the class list. Okay, so uh, what's the behavior here? Anybody? Are we, yeah. So first of all, this is gonna run forever um, uh, until we unplug it or hit control C or something. What about the class list? Yeah, class list will never get executed. So this particular instance is an example where 
uh, running the first one to completion and the second, and then the second one means the second one never runs. And okay. And furthermore, if you think about this, we have not told the system that it can interleave these because we haven't introduced any threads. So this is a process with one thread, and all it can do is first run compute pi and then run print class list. So threads, using threads correctly, starts with giving the system uh, notification of what can actually run concurrently, and then the scheduler can start doing different things for you. OK? So for instance, here we could add some threads. Now, create thread here is just a, um, is just a, a general abstraction for however you create threads in your system. But if this somehow creates a thread which is computing pi on argument pi.txt, and this is somehow creating a thread that's printing the class list uh, on class list.txt, what we've started out here is we've actually introduced concurrency to the system in a way that allows it to now start scheduling things in an interesting way. All right, create thread here is some uh, abstraction of spawning a new thread. I'll actually give you p threads later in, a, in a, this lecture. Um, as one instance. But this should now start behaving as if there's two CPUs in the system, virtual CPUs. And as a result, we will see um, digits of pi perhaps showing up in pi.txt interleaved with uh, the class list getting printed. Okay. And so why is that? Well, because we've created two threads and now the scheduler can interleave them and go forward. Now notice that this previous version even if you had a multi-core with 100 cores on it, it's still going to behave the same way because we haven't told the scheduler that there are multiple threads that can run. Okay, we've only there's only one thread that's in this code. Okay. Now, let's uh, talk some administrivia here. So, as uh, you know, homework zero is due uh, tomorrow. And uh, you really got to get going on it. What the homework zero is particularly important because it uh, gets you set up with all of the uh, infrastructure for CS162. Gets you set up with um, your GitHub account and so on. Okay, uh, it gets you set up uh, with your virtual machine. Gets you familiar with CS162 tools, and it reminds you a bit of programming in C. Which uh, also, I'm hoping that uh, most of you went to the uh, C review session yesterday. I think that uh, there were some videos that came out of that, so you should be able to look at them. But remember, homework zero is due Thursday, tomorrow. Okay, project zero was released yesterday, and um, you should uh, be working on it. Okay, it's due next Wednesday. And project zero is like a homework, should be done on your own. Okay, and um, by the way, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, that uh, the review session went well. That was our intention. Um, you know, C is is uh, a language that you probably don't have enough familiarity with uh, yet. You will have plenty by the end of the term, and it's good that uh, good to get moving on it. Okay. So um, the uh, other thing, of course, we mentioned is slip days. You have uh, because of the complexity of being virtual, you have four slip days for homework and uh, four slip days for project. That's a little more than we normally give. But um, I would say bank those. Don't spend them right away, OK? Um, and uh, because basically, you know, I'd save them for more the end of the term. Because when you run out of slip days and you turn things in late, you don't get any credit. So OK. And um, I don't have a direct estimate on project versus homework. But teach the project zero is like a homework. So get moving on it. Um, the other thing, which I hope uh, everybody realizes is that Friday, that's two days from now, is drop day. So you need to make a decision. This is an early drop class. You need to make a decision about whether uh, you're going to keep the class or not. Okay. And, um, uh, you know, it's very hard to drop afterwards. I, I don't know. Um, we had a, a student a few years ago who will remain nameless who didn't realize they were still in the class. Um, they had kind of stopped paying attention, and about halfway through the term, they realized they were still in the class, and they went to drop it, found out that it was an early drop class, and they were, uh, they were petitioning their department, they weren't in EECS, uh, to allow them to drop it, and last I'd heard, that didn't go so well. So uh, 
Um, that was because I think their one uh, late drop that you get, uh, they'd already used up. And so they basically were stuck. So don't be stuck. This is actually bad for you. This is an awesome class. I, I like to think this is you know, the most awesome class, but perhaps I'm overstating it. But if you don't wanna be in the class, drop it please um, and let other people in. So um, I don't wanna overstate that anymore, but uh, all right. Um, and by the way, as of tonight, we're probably gonna let the rest of the folks on the, on the wait list into the class as well as concurrent enrollment. So I think we are now, uh, everybody's in. Okay, unless you don't wanna be, in which case you better drop. Okay, all right. Any questions on Administrivia? I, I just wanted to uh, make sure I told that story about early drop. Okay, uh, DSP related uh, policy, you can talk to me individually and uh, about it. Okay, now I, I have everybody's letters and so on, so. Okay, as far as collaboration policy, I've said this before, but I just want to state it again. I'll, I'll stop uh, saying this every lecture, but um, be careful about your collaboration, okay? Watch it carefully. So explaining a concept to somebody in another group is fine. Discussing algorithms or testing strategies is fine. Discussing debugging approaches is fine. Searching online for generic algorithms like hash tables or whatever, that's also fine. Notice that these are not details about projects or homework. These are higher level ideas or concepts, okay? That, that's fine. What isn't fine are things like sharing code or test cases with another group or individual, including homeworks. So I know there was uh, a proposal on Piazza to have homework study groups or whatever, but in, in CS162, the homeworks are actually graded and uh, they are part of our checking policy to make sure that nobody's sharing code. So um, make sure to do your homeworks on your own. And by the way, the home, doing your homeworks on, the own, on your own, we've chosen the homeworks carefully to help you with the projects. So um, that's another reason why it's very important to make sure that you do the homeworks because they will help you along with uh, ideas in the projects. Okay. Um, you can discuss high-level concepts, but no details, okay? Nothing like, well, I would do this, or I'd have a variable that did that. You can't do any of that idea, okay? Um, copying or reading another group's code or test case is not okay. Copying or reading online code or test cases from prior years, not okay. Uh, helping somebody in another group to debug their code, not okay, okay? Yeah. Now, um, you know, we compare projects and homework submissions against prior year submissions and online solutions and take actions if we see uh, significant overlap. And don't ask your friends, don't put them in a bad position by asking them to give you an answer to a homework. That's happened uh, and it got caught and it's bad for both parties, so. All right, enough on that. So let's go back to the topics, all right? Um, if you, a negative number on the wait list, I guess that's, I have no idea what it means. Uh, I think it means that there are, uh, that we are basically allowing everybody in now at this point, but um, I think we may or may not let new people in, so. Um, so let's go back to threads, which is our big topic, and we'll get to uh, processes as well. But um, back to Jeff Dean's numbers everybody should know, uh, I brought this slide up the first day just to show you the huge range of numbers, okay? You know, in uh, everything from half a nanosecond or, or uh, hundreds of femtoseconds up into, uh, you know, seconds, okay? And really, these up here in the seconds uh, or in, the, in the, um, the, the millisecond range here can be problems, okay? Because disk seeks, you know, tens of milliseconds, uh, et cetera, you can't wait all of that time, tens of milliseconds, before you do something else. And so you want ways of overlapping uh, I.O. and compute. And so these, this number set here tells you right off the bat a very good motivation for threads, okay, which is handling I.O. in a separate thread to avoid blocking other progress. Now, threads masking I.O. latency. Um, so disk, does disk seek also include SSD? We'll talk a lot about uh, disks and SSD a little later in the term. Um, as you may be well aware, so SSD typically 
doesn't have a seek time uh, like a disk does, okay? Because SSDs are, are uh, solid state. That's what SS stands for. Uh, but there is an access time to the disk. So even that access time uh, is time that you could be off doing something else. Okay, so it's not going to be as big as 10 milliseconds, but it'll be microseconds that you might want to do something else in. So um, threads are in typically at least three states. And when we get into schedulers and in the internal of the operating system, you'll see more about these. But uh, roughly speaking, uh, a thread could be running, uh, which means it's actually got uh, a processor or a core, and it's getting CPU cycles out of that hardware, or it could be ready, which is, means it's eligible to run but not currently running, um, or blocked. And if you remember that picture I showed you earlier, let me pop it back up here just because it's uh, an easy way to say this. Maybe it's not that easy. In this instance here, if we can run A, B, and C, what that means is that while A is running, B and C are ready but not running, okay? They're on the ready list. You'll see more about this as we go. And uh, as soon as A is, um, the scheduler decides that A is done in this instance, then it picks B off the ready queue. Or in this instance where we're alternating between A, B, and C, we have A will be running while B and C are ready and, and uh, et cetera, okay? And we're gonna show you a lot more about how that actually works. But for now, uh, what's useful is really this idea of running, ready, or blocked, which is a new one, which is that that thread went off to do an operation and it made a system call to the kernel to say read uh, from disk or from a network, and it's actually not on the ready queue and it's ineligible to run. Okay, and this is where the true power, um, this is where the true power of the threads come into play because if we have two threads, then one of them can be blocked and off of the ready queue while the other one's running. Now, a question about uh, can only one core, uh, can a core run only one thread at a time? Yes, by definition, a core has a hardware thread it's running um, and that thread, uh, you know, gets pulled off the ready queue. Um, now, I will, I will talk soon about simultaneous multi-threading where perhaps this gets a little fuzzy. Okay, but um, for now, uh, the other question of how do you get from blocked to ready is basically uh, the operating system notices that a thread is blocked on I.O. The I.O. comes in and then at that point, it puts the thread on the ready queue and takes it out of blocked. Okay, because it's ready to run because the thing it was waiting for is ready. Okay, we'll get to that in much more detail. Uh, not today. So one of the, once the I.O. finishes, the OS marks it as ready, okay? And, uh, and so then, you know, as a result, we're going to have multiple virtual CPUs going through where uh, any given core has one thing that's actually running, and then the scheduler's got the rest of the things ready. So here's an example where if no threads perform I.O., then essentially they're always on the ready queue or running. And so here we have two threads. Uh, while Magenta's running, Cyan's on the ready queue, and while Cyan's running, Magenta's on the ready queue, and while Magenta's running, oh, you guys get the point. If we put I.O. in here, we get something more interesting, right? So here's an instance where um, the Magenta runs, and uh, at some point, it does an I.O. operation, and that's going to take it completely out of the ready queue and put it back um, on, the, uh, on a wait queue. Okay, so off the run, it's not gonna be running, it's not gonna be on the ready queue, it's gonna be on a wait queue associated with that IO. And now this, the blue item, which we're assuming is just computing pi or something, gets to just keep running. And there's no reason to switch because there's no other thread in this instance that can run on the ready queue. Okay, and then eventually when the IO compute, completes, the magenta is put back on the, um, on the ready queue and at that point it's, it's now available to be run. Now, a question here about um, can it go directly from block to running? So that doesn't happen that way um, just because the scheduler gets involved. And again, we'll talk more about that. And it needs a chance to run its policy to decide um, just because something's on the ready queue, it may or may not be the next thing to run. And so we typically go from blocked to, uh, to the ready queue not running immediately. Okay. So um, perhaps a better example for threads than computing pi, although given that pi is a cool number, I couldn't imagine a better example, might be the following, where um, we create a thread to read a really large file, 
maybe pi. And we create a thread to render the user interface. And what's the behavior here is that we still respond to user in, input even while we're doing something large. OK, so this first thing maybe runs part of a um, windowing server or what have you, or it's running the event loop for the, for the windowing server. And this other thing is doing something that might be either I.O. or computationally intensive. This is a great use for threads, OK? Threads for, I, for a user interface and threads for compute is a common, a common pattern, OK? Everybody with me on that? Now, um, you know, hopefully, having done homework zero, you know how to compile a C program and run the executable. So this typically creates a process that's executing the program. And initially, this new process has only one thread in its own address space with code, globals, et cetera. Um, the question we might make is, how do we make this a multi-threaded process? Well. I've kind of shown you this in pseudocode, but once the process starts, it can issue system calls to create new threads. And these new threads become part of the process, and they share its address space. And once you have threads in the same address space, now they can read and write each other's data, uh, and therefore they can, they can collaborate with each other. Okay? Whereas if you have threads in separate processes, they can't talk to each other easily. And again, I know that question came up in the, in the chat a couple of times. But the whole point of processes is to make it more difficult for them to share information. That's the protection component. And the only way you share in that instance is by explicitly deciding to communicate. OK. So let's talk about system calls. This is uh, part of, we mentioned this earlier with our dual mode discussion. So typically, if you look at an operating system, we've got this uh, narrow waste idea um, or the, the hourglass kind of design where the, the difference between user and system uh, is at the system call interface. Okay, so things running above here typically run in user mode, and that's going to be all the stuff that you uh, first start writing when you're um, in, in user mode. And things in the kernel tend to run in the system mode or kernel mode. OK, so user mode above, kernel mode below. And then, of course, we have hardware here. And what's at this, the interface here is system calls. And so the way to get from user mode into the kernel through this interface is by making a system call. OK, now many of you are probably saying, but I've never seen a system call. Um, well, you know, the operating system libraries issue system calls. Language runtimes issue system calls. And so in many cases, the system calls are actually hidden below your programming interface. OK, now a very interesting question that's in the chat here is, well, are system calls standardized across all sorts of operating systems? And the answer is no. Um, in general, uh, Windows and Unix and uh, uh, you know, OS 2 and iOS and all these different operating systems have different uh, system call interfaces, but um, there are at least one set of attempts to standardize. There's the so-called POSIX interface. And the POSIX uh, system call interface is shared at least partially across a bunch of different operating systems. Okay. Another question that's in the chat here is, if you're an administrator, are you running in user mode? Yes, most of the time. However, you're allowed to do things that take you into the kernel uh, where you might not otherwise be if you're an administrator. And we're going to tell you how that works, but you'll have to hold off on that for a moment. So for now, let's assume that user mode um, is uh, what programs are running. Kernel mode is the operating system code. And the way you get across this is an extremely carefully controlled transition. Okay. Now, here's another way to look at this. Here we have a bunch of uh, processes running on an OS. You know, they, you know, an application or a login window or a window manager. And all of them typically have um, an OS library that's been linked into them. And those applications are use the operating system by making library calls. And um, if you haven't gotten very familiar with this already, you will soon, which is libc. That's the standard library for C programmers, typically has a bunch of system calls in them that have been wrapped 
in a way, and I'll show you what I mean in a moment about that, that um, make it possible to essentially make a system, to make a, a procedure call that then makes a system call into the operating systems. And when you do that, um, the, uh, the system call is the thing that makes the transition to kernel mode, but the function uh, makes it easy to use. And this is why many of you who haven't uh, taken an operating system class have never actually looked at system calls directly. Okay, so um, libc is, is <laughs> question in the chat is, is libc standardized? Mostly, okay, <laughs> mostly. Uh, if you were to look at distinctions between Linux and uh, Berkeley standard distribution, Unix and other versions, iOS, the libc's aren't always the same. Exactly. They mostly have all the same things in them, but their arguments might be a little different and so on. All right. Um, but pretty much libc all has the same, almost always the same things in it. All right. Okay. Let's think about similarity rather than difference for the rest of the lecture here, because it'll be very easy to get lost in slight distinctions. Now, the, um, the library I want to talk about for threads is called pthreads, and the p stands for POSIX, okay? So POSIX is that attempt to um, standardize a set of system calls across a bunch of operating systems, and there is a semi-standard threading interface, and you can look it up, that is called pthreads. And perhaps the most interesting thing here to start with is pthread create which is a function call in C that you can make that's going to create a, a thread for you, okay? And typically, you have uh, several arguments which are pointers to structures, and I'll show you an example how this use, is used in a moment, that, uh, for instance, come back with a thread handle that you can control that thread by stopping it and starting it and so on. Um, some attributes of the thread, which we won't use much here, and, um, and also a function to call, and some arguments. And so really, what does pthread create do? Ignore all the, the noise in the argument list here. It starts a thread running on a procedure of your choice. And that procedure, by the way, I thought I would talk you through this because everybody ought to hear it once. What the heck does void star parenthesis star start routine parenthesis parenthesis void star parenthesis mean? <laughs> <laughs> the way you understand things like this is you go from inside to out. So what it says is start routine is a, go to the left, pointer, that's the star, to a function that has as an argument a void star item which returns a void star. So it's a start routine is a pointer to a function that takes a void star and returns a void star. Okay, isn't that fun? Now, there's also pthread exit, which is something the thread calls to exit if it wishes, although if the thread routine just ends, then the, the thread is done. And then pthread join uh, is something that says, given a thread uh, handle, wait until that thread is done and then go forward. And so join is a way to allow, say, a parent thread that has created a bunch of threads to now wait for all the threads to complete before it goes forward. Okay. Now, uh, what you should do is you should try, P stands for POSIX, all right? What you should do is try when you're running in a Unix style container, uh, including the ones that you've uh, set up, try man pthread. So man is the man, okay? This is the manual, co uh, the manual command and you say man pthread whatever and it'll tell you about pthreads or man ls or man whatever this is the unix way to access manual pages what's fun about this or whatever depends on your notion of fun is you can actually go to a google search and say man pthread and it'll work <laughs> um, or there are uh, also lots of websites out there that you can look at to see uh, information about pthreads but let's use this to get us uh, some ideas about system calls and even an example of using pthread since we're trying to talk about what does a user see. So what happens when pthread create is called? So what I see here is I see a routine pthread create that I could call in my C code from main or something like that. So what happens? Well, remember that we're calling system calls and we're hiding it in many cases from users, since we don't want regular users to have to worry about system calls. 
And so really, pthread create is a function that if you were to look inside of, li of the library you've linked it with, what you'd see is that um, it's really a special type of function, not written entirely in C, that does some work like a normal function and then has some special assembly in it that uh, sets up the registers in a way the kernel's going to recognize. And then it executes a special trap instruction, which is uh, really a way of jumping into the kernel uh, think of it almost as an error. And then the kernel says, oh, it's not really an error, it's a system call. And by jumping into the kernel this way, what we've done is we've transitioned out of user mode into kernel mode because it's an exception. And then that place we jump to very carefully figures out what system call you want, okay? And so what happens is we jump into the kernel and the kernel knows that this is the create system call for a thread and it gets the arguments, it does the creation of the thread, and then it returns, and that return in that point, there's a special place to store the return value, you're gonna all become familiar with this. And then it returns, which takes us back to user mode, and the bottom of this function, which grabs the return values, and then returns like a normal function. So this function isn't a normal function, this is a wrapper around a system call, but, as far as the user is concerned, it looks like a function and you've just linked it, okay? Okay, and a system call can take a thousand cycles, okay? It's not, it depends a lot on um, how, what it's doing. Um, it also, you have to save and restore a bunch of registers when you go into the kernel and come out again. Um, and we'll talk more about the cost of that, okay? So doing system calls is not cheap. This transition from user mode to kernel mode is more than just setting that bit. There's a whole bunch of stuff around it, and we'll talk about stuff in another lecture, okay? Now, um, okay, and when you create threads, uh, what you're doing is you're basically creating, at least initially here, a schedulable entity, and uh, in that instance, multiple things can be running, okay? And whether we transition to a new thread on during creation is a, is a different story, which we'll get into when we get to actual scheduling. But another idea that I'm just gonna introduce for this lecture briefly is this idea of fork join per, uh, pattern, which is um, a parent thread creates a bunch of other threads that run for a while, these little squiggly things are threads, and then they all exit, but what I want to do is I want to wait until they're all done with their job. So maybe they're running in parallel, et cetera. And then eventually what happens is uh, we join, namely we wait for every one of them to end, and then the single parent thread continues after all of these are done. Now there is a good question here, which I, I want to address briefly, is once we enter this assembly code, are we context switching? No, no, no. Uh, C code, when it uh, compiles, compiles into assembly, it's just that we're doing some special assembly that's a little bit out of the scope of what a C compiler usually produces, and that's why it's typically spe uh, specified as assembly language, okay? Um, the other thing is, again, don't get too worried about multi-core, because what we're talking about works perfectly well if there's only one core in the system, okay? Keep that in mind, all right? It will all run. So now that we've got fork join parallelism, let's tie everything together. So here's some code. I bet you guys thought you were gonna get out of this lecture without some complicated code. What we got here is we got a main um, function call, okay? And in this main function call, or, which is the start of the program, we have some uh, malloc statements, we have some thread creates, we have some joins, okay? And we could ask ourselves, how many threads are there in this program? We could ask, does the main thread join with the threads in the same order that they were created? We could ask, do the threads exit in the same order they were created? Uh, and if we run the program again, would the result change? So let's look here for a moment. What we see here is we start, um, by the way, this main program has been set up to take an argument. And if there's an argument, then we use it for the number of threads, otherwise we use two. So assuming there's an argument of some sort, we malloc data that is big enough to hold the handles for a bunch of threads. So these are p thread t items. And um, then we uh, print some information like where the stack is, okay? And uh, 
some other information like where is this common um, item, okay? And then we go through a loop and we create a bunch of threads. We create n of them and for each thread, uh, we keep track of its handle in uh, a thread structure, okay? So now we've gone through, let's say there are four threads. We've gone through, we create all four threads and we store handles to them. And the reason we do that is so that we can join at the end. But let's take a look at this pthread create. What you th see here is the thread function, which is surprisingly, as I mentioned before, thread function is a function um, that takes a void star and returns a void star. And by putting the thread function here, we've implicitly said put a pointer to that function there. So this creates a thread. Uh, each time, each loop, it creates a thread that calls thread function. And then finally, we um, are going to go through the thread join to finish. And if we were to run this with an argument of four, what's going to happen is the first thing is it's going to tell us uh, where the stack is, so main stack. And notice that what I did was this t function, this t uh, variable that's in the uh, local variable of main. I say take its uh, address and cache uh, and uh, basically turn it into a long and print it. And so here's an address. 7FFEE2C6B6B8 is an address that represents the stack for main. Okay. And what's interesting is we do that uh, for each of the thread functions when they run, where we have this TID uh, and we print out the, uh, the storage location for this local variable TID. And notice how they're all a little different. So each thread has its own stack. Okay. And notice also that they run in different orders. And that's because we create a bunch of them and then they get interleaved. OK? All right. And so the question is sort of how many do we create? Well, it depends on uh, the argument. Do they join in the same order they were created? Well, yes, because we, um, we go through join and we do a join on the threads in order, 0, 1, 2, 3. And therefore, the main thread waits for thread 0 to finish, thread 1, thread 2, thread 3. Um, and if a thread uh, exits early, then when we go to join, it just finishes really quickly, okay? And then if we run the program again with the result change, yes, the scheduling is gonna be different. So the threads may not wake up in the same order, okay? So there are five threads here total, yes, the four that we created uh, with pthreads in the original main one, okay? So there's always a thread created when you create a program, okay? Now. Uh, if you notice, um, now, of course, pthread exit, uh, basically, when a thread exits, it allows the join to move forward. Now, um, this join is not with null. This is, we're joining with this thread, and this is an argument that we're just not using on, on uh, pthread join. Okay, and there's four created by the for loop, because in this instance, the argument was four, and we took that argument to decide how many to create. So n thread equals two is only used if we don't have an argument. All right, so what about thread state? So the state's shared by all threads in the process address space. Okay, if you don't call pthread exit, which uh, we could easily forget, then what happens is um, it's the, uh, the thread function exiting calls pthread exit uh, basically um, uh, implicitly without you having to do it, okay? Uh, all right, so the state is shared by all threads in the processor address space. So the content of memory uh, is shared, IO states shared. Uh, state that's private to each thread in some senses, there's a thread control block in the kernel, that's why I have it read. And then there's CPU registers that are um, either in the processor or in the thread control block, depending on whether it's running or not, and a stack, okay? And what is the stack? Well, the stack has uh, parameters, temporary variables, return PCs, et cetera. So um, one view of what we just did there was there's a bunch of shared state for the, the threads, which is a heap, global variables in code, okay? And then the per thread state is there's a thread control block um, and a stack and sa saved registers for each one of the threads. Now, just to uh, quickly be on the same page with 61C material, if you remember what stacks are good for, they hold temporary results and they permit recursive execution. So if you notice here, I have some uh, pseudo code for C 
And notice these labels over here represent the memory um, that this if statement's at or the memory that uh, this B is at. Okay, so if the if statement's at A, then B might be at A plus one. Uh, these, this is just a loose idea here, so don't get too hung up on this, okay? But if we call A of one, what's gonna happen is A is gonna come in and uh, we're going to create a stack frame, okay, for procedure A to get called. Temp is one, okay, because that's uh, a local uh, argument. And the return is gonna take us to exit. Why is that? Well, when we return from this version of A, the next thing is exit and we're done. Okay, and so those are all on the stack. And now we sort of say, well, is temp less than two? Well, yes it is, because it's one. In that case, we're gonna run B. And what does B do? Well, B creates a stack frame for itself. But if you notice here, um, there aren't any local variables. So the only thing we have is the fact that when B returns, we're gonna go back to A plus two. Why is that? Well, B calls, we call B here. And then when we return, we return to here. Okay, so that return variable is actually put on the, uh, on the stack, okay? And now when C runs, it creates a, a stack frame. And eventually um, we call A of two. And notice that now we've got, um, we're calling A again recursively. So A, the first version of A is here on the stack, but by the time we go to the second version, we're down here. And is temp uh, less than two? No. So at that point, we're gonna output, uh, we're gonna print temp, which is two, and then we're gonna return. And what do we return? Well, we return to C plus one, which is down here. And C plus one is gonna return C, okay? And then eventually we get back to A plus two. We're gonna print our one. We're gonna return and we're gonna be done, okay? So there you go, that's a stack. Now the question of can, uh, is it possible for one thread stack to crash into another? Absolutely, okay? and if you look, you could say, well, what's the layout with two threads? Well, we have different stacks in the same address space. And if this stack grows too far, it's gonna mess up uh, the blue stack, okay? Um, so, you know, we start having to ask some interesting questions. How do we position stacks relative to one another? How big are they? And so on. Uh, one of the things we'll be able to talk about uh, in, a, in a few lectures is we can put what are called guard pages such that if this pink guy runs too, too long and it goes into this empty space, it'll actually cause a trap into the kernel, which can then make a decision about whether to allocate more memory or to kill off the thread, okay? And the reason there are no protections in place is because multiple threads running in a process, the process is the protection. So this is good and bad, right? It's a liability if you run uh, infinite Fibonacci style things that run into each other, because we all know everybody wants to do that all the time, as you learned in 61A. Or it's a, a benefit because now, yes, the stacks are in the same address space, but these two threads can easily share data. Okay. All right. And let me, uh, I'll get to the sharing in just a second here. Okay. And uh, how to allocate more memory. Uh, Oftentimes with a thread, if you really are running out of space, you may need to, um, there, there's an argument you can use to say, I need more stack space, okay? But um, this, is, uh, this becomes an interesting question of debugging. We'll, we'll save that for another lecture. But what I do wanna say here is the programmer's abstraction is uh, one of lots of threads all running kind of at the same time, right? An infinite number of processors, whereas the reality is some of them run and some of them don't, uh, okay? And, and it alternates. And that's that idea that we have to, we have to create our uh, code so that it runs correctly despite uh, the scheduler's interleaving. In fact, I like to think of the scheduler almost as it's, um, it's a Murphy's Law scheduler is the way to think. It's gonna do the, the interleaving that screws up your code the most. And so you need to design for all interleavings, which really means you have to do the correct thing with respect to locks, okay? And so the programmer's view here might be that we have X equal X plus one, Y equals Y plus X, et cetera. But in reality, one execution could be, well, they do run one after another. And another could be, well, X equal X plus one runs, but then we go off and we run a different one for a while and then we continue or we run the first two guys go off for a while and continue, okay? So this reordering uh, 
let's not worry about reordering so much as interleaving, okay? Now, um, so there are many possible executions, okay? And I think I've, I've hammered that point home already, but you need to keep that in mind. And before you give up and think this is impossible, in fact, proper locking discipline will take care of you here and, and uh, make sure that you run correctly under, under all interleavings, okay? And that's um, our job over uh, the next you know, couple of weeks is to give you an idea how you might possibly design things so that they work under a variety of interleavings, okay? So correctness with concurrent threads has this non-determinism component where each time you run, there's a different interleaving, okay? So the scheduler can run the threads in any order, it can switch threads at any time, and it makes testing difficult. In fact, it makes testing uh, of all possible interleavings not in principle even possible. Now there are folks in the department who know how to test up to a certain depth of interleaving, and there's some pretty elegant uh, results in that mode. But um, there's one instance where things can be done, and that's when the threads are independent and they don't share any state, and they're um, say in separate processes, then it really doesn't matter what order they run because uh, you'll always get the same answer, and that's a deterministic result. Cooperating threads, which are running in the same process, suddenly we've got this non-determinism and we have to worry about it. Um, so if you could somehow make everything always independent, then you've got deterministic behavior and you're in good shape. Um, of course, even when you think things are independent, they're all running on top of the same operating system. And we all know that uh, an operating system crash or bug can screw up um, pretty much anything. But let's not worry about that for now. So the goal is correct by design. So just to point this out, we have some race conditions. So what if initially x is zero and y is zero, and we have two threads, one of which sets x equal to one and the other sets y equal to two? What are the possible values of x when we're done? Well, that's not even very interesting, right? It must be one because b doesn't interfere, okay? More interesting, of course, is this one where maybe thread A does X equal Y plus one and then thread B says Y equals two or Y equals Y times two. What are the possible outputs there? Well, it could be one, three or five non-deterministically, okay? And so um, more interesting, okay? Now um, that's because we're essentially racing A against B and uh, this is bad code, okay? Yes. This has non-deterministic answers, but you wrote code that should never have been written this way. Okay, and we're gonna try to avoid race conditions. Now, let me show you a, a good reason for sharing. There were some questions uh, earlier. So threads can't share stacks, and the reason for that fundamentally is that uh, the stack represents the current state of an execution. And if you had two threads on the same stack, they'd just screw each other up and you'd lose you'd lose that. Go back through my thread or my uh, stack example and think through that for a moment. So threads all have to, each thread has to have its own stack. Now, um, here we have an instance of, uh, for instance, a red black tree, which you probably ran into in 61B. Um, maybe thread A does an insert and thread B does an insert and then a get. If you just wrote code like this, that tree would get screwed up, okay? Um, so, and yes, every thread has its own uh, stack in, uh, in the uh, process, okay? So um, this particular instance of thread A and thread B is absolutely not gonna work. You're guaranteed to get a wrong result. So some uh, quick definitions, which we are again gonna go through in much more detail in subsequent lectures, are the following. So synchronization is coordinating among threads regarding some shared data in a way to try to prevent race conditions and prevent you from getting the wrong answer. So some, num some uh, ideas, mutual exclusion basically ensures that only one thread does a particular thing at a particular time. So uh, one thread excludes the others from a chunk of code, it's a type of synchronization. A critical section for this, uh, for this lecture is code that exactly one thread can execute at a time. Okay, it's the result of mutual exclusion. And a lock is an object that only one thread can hold at a time and it's used to provide mutual exclusion. Now, these things we're gonna talk in much more detail and we're actually gonna tell you how to build locks. That's gonna be an interesting discussion in a couple of lectures. 
But for now, a lock is going to be a way to give us mutual exclusion. And locks have a very simple interface. They, you can acquire the lock, and you can release the lock. And when a thread acquires the lock or tries to acquire the lock, what happens is if some other thread currently has the lock, other threads that are trying to acquire it are put to sleep. And when that thread that has the lock finally releases it, then one and only one of those threads is allowed to acquire it. So this mutual exclusion given by locks, okay, namely only one thread can acquire at a time, is going to allow us to start building correct code, even with a lot of parallelism and, and concurrency in there. Okay, and don't worry about how to implement this. We will talk about that in great detail later. But how would we use that in this example? Well, uh, the two threads would acquire a lock on the whole data structure or on the root of it, okay? Insert three and then release it. Or maybe thread B acquires the lock, inserts four and releases it. Um, there's a, an elegance to how to distribute your locks that you're gonna get to start thinking about. Like you could have a single lock at the root and if you grab a lock, then you know that if A grabs the lock, then it knows that thread B can't be anywhere in this data structure. So it can just do its own thing and insert. And then when it releases, then B can know that A is not in the data structure and so on. Um, or you can start distributing locks throughout and you can do a, um, a more sophisticated thing where you grab a lock and then you grab another lock and so on, okay? But, um, for this purpose of this lecture, think of grabbing a single lock at the root. That's going to clean things up for us. Okay. All right. Now there's an interesting question here about uh, single instruction operations on various shared variables. And those are uh, special types of hardware interlocks we're going to talk about where you don't actually need a lock. Okay. And yes, there's plenty of different types of lock, although um, we'll also talk about that as we go forward. Now, P threads, again, P for POSIX, has a locking infrastructure. That thing we just talked about is called a mutex, okay? And you can initialize a brand new mutex, and then the different threads in the system can use lock and unlock, and uh, it'll work like I just said, okay? So you'll, you'll have a single thread that'll come back, okay? That's that mutex structure, and then you'll use that mutex uh, in different threads, and as long as they all use the same mutex, then they'll all have that locking behavior I just said, and, and pthread lock will lo grab the lock, and unlock will release the lock. Okay, and a mutex is just uh, another name for lock in this instance, okay? So you'll get a chance to use these in homework one. So here's an example of our thread function for our multiple threads. So mutex is a type of lock, yes. And here, um, our critical section uh, could be where we have this common integer that's a global variable, but we have a bunch of threads that are on it. If you try to increment a, a global variable, uh, the simple version of increment here is going to get all screwed up if you have multiple threads on it. By grabbing the lock, incrementing, and releasing the lock, then you can make sure that that shared variable uh, does not get screwed up. Okay. All right. Now, are there any questions on that before I, um, I want to say a little bit about processes now before we are uh, out of time. So what it means when a thread holds a lock is that the thread has executed the lock acquire operation, whatever that is. Here it's p thread mutex lock, and it's succeeded. Then the, the thread that succeeded and was allowed to continue has the lock. Okay, so in this instance, because this is now a critical section, there's only one thread that's ever allowed to get past the lock at a time. And so only one thread can be in this critical section at a time. And we say that that thread has the lock. Okay. And if a thread tries to acquire the lock and the lock is already acquired, what happens is it's put to sleep until it's released and then it allow is allowed out. So only one thread's allowed in this critical section at a time. Okay. All right. And, and keep in mind, this thread function is run by many threads simultaneously. So we're talking about a scenario where many threads are running at the same time. Okay. 
So let's talk about processes briefly before we uh, uh, run out of time here. So how do we manage process state? And so we've been talking about, for instance, multi-threaded um, multi -threaded processes where each of the threads has a stack and some register storage. And then of course there's sort of global code, data and files, okay? And um, just to, uh, let me just say this uh, again, answering the question, what constitutes a critical section is the piece of code that's being protect, protected by the lock. Okay, that's the critical section. It's the piece of code where only one thread's allowed to execute that little piece of code at a time. Okay, and it could be many, could be many instructions, it could be many uh, things in there. Okay, now, okay. So now what we're gonna, um, I'm gonna move on to processes. So if you remember the life of a process is the kernel, uh, execs the process, we kind of talked about this last time, and then when it's done, it exits and we go forward. So rather than threads, we're actually talking here about creating a brand new address space and moving into user mode, okay? And once we uh, are in user mode, then there's a lot of ways that we get into the kernel, like we talked about system calls. Um, interrupts are another thing that we uh, will talk about where an interrupt might involve, say, accessing some hardware here, and then eventually, we return from interrupt or an exception like a divide by zero or um, a page fault, other things might bring us into the kernel, et cetera, okay? But that's still, we're, this lecture is about user mode. So what, how do we create new processes, okay? So processes are always created by other processes, okay? So how does the first process start? This is like asking about the big bang, right? Well, the first process is started by the kernel. It's often configured uh, as an argument to the kernel before the kernel boots, and it's often called the init process. And then that init process creates all the other ones in a tree, okay? And all processes in the system are created by other processes at that point. Now, um, we're only gonna have time for a couple of these process management APIs here, but the first one here that's easy is exit. So here we have main, okay? The process got created, we execute exit, it ends the process, okay? So this is not particularly um, maybe interesting to you, except for the fact that every process has an exit code, which can then be grabbed by its parent, where the parent is gonna be the process that created it, okay? And by the way, this is completely different from the dot init segment in the ELF uh, library. So notice that, um, this uh, initial process, the init process is actually a process, okay, that's running in the system and you can find it typically if you know where to look, okay, because it's typically if it exits then the, then the system crashes and goes away. So exit's not maybe that interesting except that it has an argument and zero means successful exit, whereas uh, anything else is non-zero says unsuccessful and uh, the parent process can find that, okay. So what if we let main return without ever calling exit? Well, in that instance, you actually uh, get a, um, an implicit exit as well, okay? Um, the OS library calls exit for you successfully. All right, the entry point of the executable is in the OS library. So the OS library, when you do a compile and link, uh, basically says that main is the program that gets called. Almost think of this as the the first thread actually calls main and then it exits and it kills off the process when you execute exit, okay? And um, exit code and return code will essentially do um, similar things, okay? Now, and if you notice, uh, if main returns, the library calls exit, all right. So let's look at uh, something more interesting. And, and unfortunately, we're not gonna have a lot of time for this, but hopefully you guys can stick around for five more minutes, I, I wanna talk about fork, because fork is one of the most interesting, strange things that we're gonna talk about uh, for process management, because it's, uh, it's sort of a legacy uh, operation in some sense, but it's also kind of the backbone of a lot of the way that Unix operating systems work, and it's uh, the one that you're uh, looking at as well, Pintos is gonna be similar to that. And fork is used to create a brand new process. And what it does is, it copies the current process uh, entirely. So if you imagine that you have one process with all of its address space, what fork does is it copies the whole thing, 
to another process, okay, or to another address space, and then it starts running in the other address space. So now when you're done, you have two identical copies of things running, whereas before you only had one. So fork is really taking and duplicating everything about a process, okay? And this is gonna be a little weird, so this is why I'm hoping you'll give me this extra five minutes. With the return value from fork is uh, basically one of three things. If it's greater than zero, then you know you're running in the original parent, and the return value is the process ID of the new child. If you get back zero, you know you're the new child. And if you get back less than zero, it's an error. Okay, and PID here means process ID. Okay, so the state of the original process is duplicated in both the parent and the child. Okay, pretty much everything, address space, file descriptors, et cetera. So here's a good example where uh, we're running along and we call fork, okay? And at the point that we call fork, as soon as we return from fork, a very weird thing happens. We now have two processes that are running, two of them, and those two processes are identical, except for the thing that comes back from fork. So in one of them, we get a value greater than zero, and the other one, we get a value equal to zero. And only when fork fails, because uh, say fork has run out of memory or something, then only one of them comes back and we say fork failed. Now there was a question about fork, uh, a fork bomb. That would be an instance where we are forking so many times uh, that we have so many processes running that memory runs out and uh, we're toast. And often that's usually because of a bug in the operating system or something, okay? But if you notice um, in this instance, where uh, things work, the original process does not get killed. It's happily running, but it comes back with CPID greater than zero, all right? And the child comes back with it equal to zero. And if you notice here, so that means the parent is running there, okay? So let's take a look here. So we, uh, we call fork, and now suddenly we have two things that have uh, returned from fork and two different processes. Uh, and one of them, the original parent, that's what P stands for, has CPID greater than zero, which is the uh, PID of the child. And basically you can say, well, my, I get my own PID. I can say I'm the parent of that child. Otherwise, you can say here's my PID, okay? Okay. Now, um, memory allocated by other threads. Uh, so typically the memory is going to be duplicated, but you're only going to have one thread running initially in that other that other process, okay? Now, if you fork and fork again, uh, you would end up potentially with a tree. That was a question, except for the fact that if you could have uh, the parent do the fork again, but the child not, and then you'd have three processes running, okay? So uh, it may be a tree, but it doesn't have to be a, a, a binary tree, okay? So again, we're gonna make sure that we leave with this rather strange concept, okay? It's that once we execute fork in the original single process, when we're done, there's two of them, two that are identical, except when one of them runs, fork returns a value greater than zero, and when the other one runs, fork returns zero. And that is the way that those two processes know whether they are the parent or the child, okay? And you're thinking about this too hard if you try to think about somebody's created already, it's somebody else. In fact, what happens is the memory space is exactly duplicated and the original parent, uh, there, are, there is information in its process uh, table as to whether it was the parent or not. And so we will get the return back and the processes are put in a tree inside the kernel because the parent has linkages to all of its children, okay? And if the child calls fork, then it becomes the parent for the things that it just created, okay? And so we get everything's duplicated, including the stack. And they're not the same address space because they're duplicated address spaces. They have the same values, not the same address space. Now, um, lest you go away from this lecture thinking that sounds ridiculously expensive, how can that possibly be the right thing to do? I will tell you that you play tricks 
with page tables so that you don't actually copy everything. What you do is you copy the page table and you set them as read only and you do some tricks, okay? And that's gonna be topic for another more fun discussion. And yes, Linux has a version of a uh, fork called Spawn that doesn't actually do this copying. But again, we'll get to that later. I want you guys to all understand fork for now, okay? And here is a race for you, okay? And uh, the question is, if you look, what happens here if we fork and we say in the parent, we uh, have i equals zero to i plus one and we go forward and in the child, we go backwards. What gets printed out? Does anybody want to uh, make an argument about this? What does it print? Does it get confused where i goes up a little and then down and then up a little and then down? I see somebody says infinite loop. Yes, great, different I. Because the processes are completely different, I is completely different and the parent goes up and the child goes down and they don't interfere with each other. The only thing that happens is an interleaving might be different based on scheduling. Very good. Okay, because the prints are printing the same standard out. All right, good. Um, and then uh, we will pick up with this next time because we're out of space, but for exec, by the way, here, look, this is the code. The way we create a brand new process is we fork uh, a new process and then we call exec, which immediately says, throw out all of my address space and replace it with this new program. And that's how a new program is created. All right. So in conclusion, we've been talking about, um, yes, it's true for global variables are copied as well. So they're completely separate address spaces with no interaction because they're separate processes. They are not threads. So there's only racing for IO ordering on the same output screen, but not anything to do with any of the computations. All right, so threads uh, are the unit of concurrency, okay? Uh, they're abstraction of a virtual CPU. A process is a protection domain or address space with one or more threads. And we can see the role of the OS library and the system calls are how we control uh, access and entrance uh, to the kernel, okay? And the, finally, uh, the question was, if the parent gets killed, does the child die? No, what happens is, in fact, when the parent gets killed, if the child is still running, then uh, a grandparent uh, inherits the child and ultimately a knit inherits the child if it's still running. Um, so, all right. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Sorry for going over a little bit, but I wanted to make sure that we talked about Fork. Uh, may you all have a great uh, holiday weekend. Re remember, no class on uh, Monday. And also remember that uh, Friday is drop day. So if you want to be in the class, great. If you don't, please drop. All right. Ciao, all. And uh, have a great weekend. Bye.